we're now going to go on to our final speaker. Isla is a free speech and women's rights advocate. Since the late 1980s, she's worked as an advocate for whistleblowers and on women's liberation issues since 2012 and since 2018 on the campaign for sex-based rights. And the title of her talk is Estrangement Within Families and Friendships in the Gender Debate. I'll be talking about um, a couple of different topics today. Uh, just initially, a very quick roundup on uh, what's been happening in Australian media in the last couple of months. Uh, and then I'm going to go on and talk about uh, issues around family and friendship breakdowns, a uh, very personal perspective, but um, with a board of, broader view looking at how uh, the gender debate is impacting on uh, cohe cohesiveness in our community. Um, we've had an exciting uh, couple of months in Australia, uh, starting to get some traction from uh, uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC and SBS, uh, not uh, largely due to their initiatives, but due to the pressure being put on the ABC and SBS from uh, gender critical uh, feminists. Um, firstly, we had uh, a couple of months ago, uh, an SBS program on sport. And I'm just going to read to you the result of a complaint that was put in uh, to SBS uh, about their reportage on this. Uh, one of our um, activists here wrote a complaint to the SBS complaining about the uh, lack of impartial and fair reportage. Um, the organisations audience and consumer affairs department found uh, in her favour uh, and that the story did not include relevant research showing that trans women can retain physical advantages. Uh, the findings were terrific, um, that the report did not provide an adequate overview of the available science. Uh, it did not include reference to relevant recent research. The story was materially misleading and breach standards for accuracy and impartiality. So we had a bit of a win there. Um, the second uh, most amazing story that came out on ABC's Media Watch program, which is um, a pretty hard hitting weekly uh, program covering uh, media stories. And in this case, it was uh, Paul Barry as host of the program, attacking the ABC for its complete failure to cover the Tavistock gender issue um, and how it was relevant to Australia. Uh, you can actually Google this uh, if you wanted to have a look at it. It's on, the title is ABC Skips Tavistock. Um, what's interesting is that the response from an ABC spokesperson to ABC's Media Watch scathing attack on, on the uh, uh, broadcaster, um, the response basically was just quite appalling. Um, it said, the debate surrounding transgender treatments is very important and the ABC has covered it in depth, which is a complete porky. The focus of our coverage is what is happening in Australia and Australian practices differ significantly to those that were in Tavistock. The change in Britain's model could certainly form part of future coverage where it's re relevant. Um, but what's interesting is that our national investigative reportage program, ABC Four Corners, while it's still done two uh, sort of puff pieces on Michelle Telfer from the Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne Gender Clinic um, has still uh, refrained from producing any impartial report on gender clinics in Australia, uh, particularly subsequent to this uh, move with the Tavistock. Um, additionally, uh, just uh, last week, there was a ABC program called Q&A with the new host, Stan Grant, um, this was on sport yet again. All the five panellists, including trans sportsperson Hannah Mouncey, um, were all uh, pro-trans or somewhat impartial. Uh, a complaint was put in 
to the ABC and at the last minute, um, uh, Deborah Akerson, who is a former professional weightlifter who previously competed with Laurel Hubbard at um, Commonwealth Games, was included in the program, but she only got five minutes. Uh, interestingly, they put in a, a health professional who clearly was in the audience positioned to put forward the, the position of, well, the science isn't really, uh, you know, fully, fully uh, decided. Uh, another astonishing program from the ABC, given the, the uh, previous decision um, with SBS Sport Program. Um, there had been an SBS sports program probably about three months ago, which was fairly balanced on SBS Insight. Uh, the producer for that, Connor Webster, also did a, a follow up program on broken families, actually, and I appeared on that panel. Um, but uh, the panel was, I think, very stacked. And um, it was, you know, once again, I think there are people in the media, particularly ABC and SBS, who really want to do a professional uh, approach to their coverage in on these issues, but their hands are being tied and basically they're in fear for their positions. Um, we've had two big exposés in the national paper, The Australian, recently, actually just one in The Australian, and I'll show it to you. It's a first for Australia. Um, I, I don't know whether you can see that, but it's um, a detransitioner story. It's the first detransitioner story that's hit the press in Australia uh, about Ollie Davies. Um, and uh, it's received a lot of sharing and, and coverage. Um, what's most interesting is that at the end of the article, Ollie Davies actually refers to uh, the trans movement as being somewhat of a cult. Um, the other news that we had in the Age and Sydney Morning Herald was the first detransitioner uh, legal action being taken against a psychiatrist. This was um, uh, reported a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the biggest bombshell that came out was uh, in the Daily Telegraph, and that was a report on uh, Kit Kowalski's uh, brilliant investigation into ACON. ACON is the Stonewall counterpart. Um, and so ACON's activities in, uh, you know, forcing compliance with trans dogma um, has been finally exposed in the Daily Telegraph by uh, journalist Clarissa Bai. So Clarissa's been doing some excellent journalism um, in Australia. So that's the roundup that I can give you at the moment. Um, Tasmanian media continue to be completely resistant to covering issues. Um, I put out a media release a couple of weeks ago um, after writing to the Children's Commissioner here, uh, calling on her to establish uh, an independent inquiry, which she has the powers to do, um, to investigate the current Tasmanian Gender Service in light of um, their affirmation only approach uh, and of course the Tavistock decision. Uh, not even the Mercury would cover this even though I've um, given them information for health professionals who are prepared to speak to these issues and their contact details, including the National Association of Practicing Psychiatrists. And of course the usual re reason why media aren't covering these issues and this was something that was said to me in a face-to-face -face meeting with the editor of the Mercury. They have to be very careful of harm. So this, this uh, you know, false notion that if you report uh, impartially on this, trans people will be hurt, um, is the excuse that editors and journalists are using not to cover the other side of the story. We're very familiar with that. Well. That's all on that subject. So I'll move on to this other issue about um, broken families and broken friendships. And this is such a heartrending 
thing for so many of us in this movement that long-standing friendships that we've had with people for many years um, relationships with brothers sisters aunties uncles children um, uh, are being put under in intense pressure and many of us have been dumped if you like um, because of our transphobic and bigoted views allegedly um, I think that there's a number of reasons this for this when it comes to um, young people uh, disassociating from family members. And I'll, I'll look at that a little bit later when I've finished um, explaining my own personal experience. Uh, I have a daughter who is uh, 33 uh, years of age. Uh, she uh, trained at the National Institute of Dramatic Art uh, in acting. She returned to Tasmania some seven or eight years ago and set up a, her own uh, theatre company, a feminist theatre company called Loudmouth Theatre Company. And she was the director, producer. She basically is very talented, multi-skilled and highly regarded within the arts community here in Tasmania. And um, she is part of the LGBTQI movement here in Tasmania. She eventually changed her identification labels to become genderqueer, I found out this year. Uh, she had at one point identified as bisexual. She married a man three years ago um, and two years ago had a daughter, her first child. Um, my daughter is my only child and my only family here in Tasmania. Um, my daughter was well aware of the work that I did on uh, women's human rights. Uh, I'd previously worked on the campaign on um, uh, to stop brothels here in Tasmania. Sheila Jeffries came over to Tasmania to work uh, with us on that campaign. I've mentioned this uh, before in my previous interview. And um, so she was well aware of my views. And in about 2017, 18, I started to work on the gender critical uh, issue and helped set up the group Women Speak Tasmania. Um, in 2019, uh, she returned home. Uh, she lost the flat she was living in. She came home to live in a little studio I have here with her then partner. And within a matter of two weeks of her being here, somebody informed me of a Facebook posting that uh, she had posted to her page two months prior to her coming home. And I'm just going to read this to you because it, it's really important for people to understand the way that uh, trans rights supporters and activists work. And I usually uh, use the, the terminology um, that these people use four methods. They denounce, so it's denunciation, um, disassociation, denial, and um, there's one more and I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But, but these are the main techniques that they use. And I was publicly denounced on her Facebook page in this manner. I want to make it 100% clear that I do not stand with my mother, Isla McGregor, or her friend and colleague, BW, in their transphobic, anti-trans, anti-sex worker beliefs and actions. And I condemn their poor quality, below the belt, personal, personal and biased attacks on activists and members of the LGBTQIA plus community that are masters journalism, but are pure bigotry and discrimination. They are not defending free speech, they are defending hate speech. I love and honour my mother as my mother for many of the things she's done in her life, but on these issues, we will never see eye to eye and I will always stand by my trans, NB and SW siblings in the struggle for their human rights. I will not use the terms turf or swerve because I refuse to acknowledge 
the claim that people who are anti-trans or anti-sex worker are feminists in any way, let alone a radical one. I will not participate in the theft of the beautiful word radical by this toxic and oppressive movement. Now, as you can imagine, when I read this, I was in a bit of a state of shock and disbelief because I really could not fully appreciate how uh, the daughter that I had had lost any contact with an ability for critical thinking. Uh, nor could I believe that she was prepared to make these posts on Facebook. So I attempted to resolve these issues um, uh, to no avail. I would never have allowed her to come home and stay here. There were alternatives she could have taken. Had I known that these were her feelings about me and my views, it was a very difficult time to have her living here um, because her level of hostility geared up. Um, it was quite palpable. She constantly silenced me. She wouldn't allow me to discuss the issues. She, even in the lead up to her moving home, she absolutely refused to do discuss the issues or hear my perspective at all. Now, we'll all be familiar with this. This is just the pattern. You can't ask questions. You can't actually engage. There's no openness. You're walking on eggshells. So um, she eventually, uh, after getting married, a couple of months later, uh, she left here and um, I wrote her and her partner a couple of letters saying there are ways that you can agree to disagree and that's the important thing, that there are other things in your relationship. Um, and I also raised the issue that, uh, that as I knew she was preparing to have a family, that this would likely not make it possible, although I didn't rule it out because I wanted to leave the door open for future discussions. Uh, very difficult for me to have a grandparenting role with a child who is going to be brought up in this cult with um, this sort of uh, uh, anti-biological sex perspective. Um, I only found out this year that um, uh, after doing the SPS Insight program that um, my daughter refers to her daughter as a they them. The they them is two years old, by the way. Uh, I, I doubt she has registered a gender, a, sorry, a sex on the birth certificate because we have sex self ID here. Um, and I feel very sad for this little person um, uh, that uh, she both is being brought up with this cult that will have a lasting impact on her and I believe potentially lead to mental health problems for herself as well. Um, it is possible that one day she may uh, seek the grandmother out and, um, you know, I will, uh, of course, be open to that. Um, uh, because of my public role on this issue in Tasmania, um, uh, both at local council level and in the, in the media, even though we haven't had much reportage, uh, you know, I'm very much associated with the, the uh, gender critical push in the state. Um, she has supported the people who have opposed me. Um, she supported the people who I worked with uh, for the public forum here in February with the coalition uh, for biological reality, the big public forum we had in Hobart. So it's been, um, it's an issue that most people in the arts community are aware of, the fact that uh, Maeve McGregor is distanced her mother and there is no relationship because her mother's a turf. Um, uh, so it's, it's well known. And it's something that so many of us have experienced, even with other members of my family, um, they don't want to discuss this issue with me um, and many of the women I work with have lost relationships with brothers, um, uncles, aunties or there's just no opportunity to discuss them. 
So uh, two years ago, there was a big write-up in the Sydney Morning Herald about estranged families. And um, in one short paragraph, the author said that one of two of the main issues that caused estrangement in families was sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, which I thought, thought was very interesting. I would tend to think that more today, it's less about sexual orientation and about, you know, 500% more about gender identity. So I think there are, there are drivers for why young people are disassociating from their parents on this issue, drivers for why this phenomenon is happening. And I'd just like to outline what I think are the, the key drivers for this. Firstly, uh, and I'm sure most people will agree, social media. Social media plays a major role in entrenching and um, provoking um, hostile attitudes towards people you disagree with and in promoting this ideology as a, a reality and truthful. Uh, two, the high levels of mental illness amongst young people. I recall my daughter saying to me uh, some years ago that every one of her friends was on medication for some mental Ill, illness uh, problem. And I think this leaves them very vulnerable and very exposed to finding some sort of support wherever they can. And I think that one of the areas where they get this support is through connecting with other like-minded groups or people or tribes. And I think the LGBTIQ tribe is a, is a very big tribe. It's a very influential tribe. And I think it certainly is a very oppositional tribe. Um, I think also the need to conform to uh, dominant cultural narratives exists, uh, particularly in relation to um, people in the workplace, particularly in the area of media, entertainment and the arts. And a lot of the TRAs are working in this arena and they're looking for uh, careers in media, entertainment and the arts, just like my daughter. And if you do not comply um, with this trans ideology, uh, you will lose your career. And I've made this comment to my daughter that uh, I understand the, the pressures, the social pressures that she could be under. Um, and that uh, if she were to let on in the least um, uh, where she stands uh, on this issue, if it changes from the dominant uh, way of thinking, she will lose her career and that's the end of it. At one point she did agree with me uh, about the Nordic model laws, um, but she didn't want to talk about it anymore. It was sort of a cut off. Yes, I, I see the point. I understand Nordic model law, but that's it, finished. Um, and finally, climate change. Um, is creating huge anxiety for young people. And this hooks in once again to the mental illness stuff, but it's an overarching thing. It's cl climate change and global conflict. And I think the, the insecurity levels of young people today are through the roof and I have enormous compassion. And I think this is a major driver. Um, what I find quite sad about this is that along with all the other rhetoric about you know, transphobic bigots and, um, you know, privilege and all these, these words that they use to describe people who don't conform to their thinking, is that, um, you know, there's also this blame game with our generation. I hear a lot of even journalists and young people talking about this is a generational issue. In other words, the old people are just going to drop off the perch one day and it won't matter. We will prevail. You know, the oldies are going to die out and the right way of thinking will, will prevail and we will have, I think, what uh, uh, George Orwell said, when the language is perfect, the revolution will be complete. We will have that state that, that they so want and us dinosaurs will, um, will have, have, have gone somewhere else. <laughs> so. 
but I think uh, it's it's a very frightening world for young people to be looking into the future and they do need to find solidarity in terms of what they're going to be faced with and I think that is the really tragic thing that they're finding solidarity over something so fictitious and flimsy and that when push comes to shove the realities of resilience and and commitment are just going to disappear yeah so i think i think that's all from me but i think uh, uh more people need to be publicly talking about um this dissolution this is happening this disassociation the disconnect in our society um over this ideology and that part of the ideology is to do this it is to dump your family that's what happens in cults <laughs>